Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Golda here. And I'm going to be going over the pretty big 14-game main slate we have here on Friday, July 28th. We are quickly approaching the trade deadline here in um, in baseball. Uh, so we got to be aware of what kind of dynamics um, you know that introduces to DFS. Um, some guys will get moved, right? We're on full-on hug watch here the next couple of days this series uh, going into Monday, um, which is the trade deadline. So uh, some guys are going to get moved. We've already seen some moves over the last several days. Uh, notably, Lucas Giolito is making his debut for the Angels tonight. Uh, he's not even, like DraftKings didn't even switch him over to, like they just, couldn't change the team name from the White Sox to the Angels in the player pool. Uh, so he's not even in the player pool as of right now. Um, who knows? They may – they do this sometimes. They adjust the player pool throughout the day. Um, they may include him at some point. But as of right now, uh, he is not in there, so we can't play him. But that's who it is. Um, do, do we want to play him against Toronto? I mean, you know, probably not at 9,600. But, you know, he is in there as uh, the starter for the – or still on the White Sox. He's in the player pool, just not as, um, you know, the Angels. So DraftKings may very well not just, you know, just not credit his points. So um, I actually haven't even seen an official announcement about that because DraftKings is a circus act. In any case, a uh, lot of games here, ton of arms. We do have projections and, and ownership loaded, uh, of course. A um, lot of, a lot of, you know, aces, I, I guess, really going up at the top here. That's why we see some big green numbers. Um, and, you know, some attackable guys down here in the lower range. Maybe a, a piece here or there that we could consider getting to, um, you know, what should probably jump out at us is Grayson Rodriguez. He's 6,300. That's a pretty damn good price against the Yankees. We'll talk about that game here in a minute. Um, Bobby Miller in the sort of mid-range. He gets the Reds tonight in L.A. at a good price tag. Uh, you know, we'll talk about that when we get there, too. So, um, looks to be kind of a balanced construction. Maybe some guys that are a bit overpriced for their particular matchups here up top. And you may want to get down here into the mid-range a little bit. Um, but who knows? Let's, uh, let's just get into the games. we got a lot to talk about. So, I don't want to be, you know, sitting here for an hour and a half or whatever, necessarily. Um, as usual, watch this on, you know, one and a half or, or even... Uh, faster speed to get through it. Let's let's go. Uh, Garrett Cole on the mound for the Yanks against Grayson Rodriguez. Garrett Cole, I think he's just too expensive still at 11,000. Now, um, you know, the strikeout rate is ticking back up, pointing closer and closer to the 30% mark, uh, which is encouraging, right? Still not walking people, still, for the most part, staying off of the barrel. Uh, that's all great. 67% strike one, 31% chase, 28.5% CSW. That's a little low for Garrett Cole, to be quite honest. Um, plate discipline, though, overall is is great. 275, 280 ERA. Expected pointing a, a little bit north of that. Um, given his performance this season, he's really just been, he's been super consistent. He's got about... Uh, you know, 14 of his 21 starts here have been north of 20 DK points. That's pretty damn good, right? So you could play him in, in cash, right, in that respect. However, in tournaments, he's only popped for north of 25 in, I think, um, like six or seven of those starts, right? So it, it drops off the table pretty quickly. And when we're paying the most expensive price tag for a starting pitcher on the day for him... I mean, this is 14 games, right? There's some expensive offenses that we're probably going to want to try and get to tonight, and it's going to prohibit me from getting to a lot of Garrett Cole. It's not that the the spot is necessarily bad, right, over here against Baltimore. They're a dangerous offense, right? Um, but C Cole is a well above average right-hander, of course, and, and, the, and the O's, all of their numbers are right around average. Hit for a little bit more power than average. Slightly better ground ball to fly ball ratio than average. Slightly better strikeout rate than average. Uh, but everything else is is right in line with league average. And I like playing the Orioles against average and below average arms, of which Garrett Cole is not, right? So um, if you land on some Cole, I've got no problem really getting there. I think the upside is, you know, a lot of the upside is really priced in here at 11000 
Um, I don't want to dig too deeply into the arsenals or anything. I mean, we kind of know the deal with Garrett Cole. He's a strong four-seamer slider. That gives him the fly ball lean. Um, I would like to get to some neutral ground ball to fly ball left-handers from the left side of the plate. You know, that's like a gunner a little bit, but he's 5,100. I don't want to go out of my way to do that. Same thing with Rutch. He's 52. Santander is okay, 4,400. Ryan O'Hearn still cheap at 3,200. That's fine. Uh, I don't want to go out of my way to be stacking against Garrett Cole, though, however. It's still a, a hard ballpark to hit the baseball out of anymore since they uh, you know, adjusted the dimensions. So I don't want to go out of my way to either play Garrett Cole at this particular price tag in this particular matchup, uh, nor do I want to really stack the O's. So it's kind of a write-off um, in those two respects for me. Grayson, for... Baltimore, 6300 I do like the price tag here. Um, now, every single number is going to tell us to stay the hell away. This is a bad, bad spot. And we may very well get Aaron Judge back tonight. He's 6000 Uh Do I really want to play him? Yeah, probably not. I mean, you can play him every day. Let's not get it confused. Like, you have to have exposure to the guy pretty much every day against everybody. Um, especially a guy that's given up a 12% barrel rate with a 10% walk rate and a 188 ISO to the right side of the plate. Uh, Judge still a fly ball hitter, right? Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball for Grayson. He, Judge is going to match up pretty well. It's not necessarily just Judge, though, that you'd want to play. As I've mentioned uh, a few times recently with respect to Aaron Judge and, like, Jordan Alvarez, um, these guys just make their entire lineup so much more difficult to go after because now you have to worry about the best hitter in the list not beating you. And that means you're forced to go after other guys. Grayson, he's still a young arm here. He's got an excellent changeup, uh, even though the value doesn't quite display that. This is a really, really good pitch here. I mean, you can see that to the four-seamer, the, the velocity delta is 13 miles an hour. That is out of control good off the charts good you do not see this kind of velocity delta so that's why you see so much really good value on the changeup when the four seamer is giving up this much value relative to the rest of the league the changeup is just so so good if he can eke out more value out of this four seamer you would see the changeup getting three and four outs above the field it's probably it's like a a kyle hendricks type changeup it is so excellent so this is the one pitch that is going to keep Grayson really in play here. Obviously, he's got the slider. Which he's going to do some swing and miss with that. He's going to give back some of that swing and miss with the cutter against lefties, of course. And that's why we see some pretty suspiciously high power numbers allowed for Grayson here. Um, but the walk rate, the barrel rate, and just kind of these surface numbers, right, they're not impressive. 45% hard contact here is not good even though he's inducing, you know, buck 35 ground ball to fly ball here, three and a half homers per nine is still a, a, a worrisome figure to say the least, right? 91 mile an hour average exit velo. It's a high figure. And Grayson, he's still a young arm, right? Just made his debut earlier this season. And they had to send him down because of these bad numbers. Um, with Judge back, it, it kind of takes me off of him a little bit. However, Judge's main weakness is a changeup is a really, really good change. That's where he swings and misses the most. And let's not get it confused here. Judge still going to strike out, right? Um, now, the, the strikeout rate for the Yankees has ticked down precipitously since Judge went out, but he's actually going to contribute positively, if you're an opposing starting pitcher, uh, in that respect. So the, the WRC+, plus, the power numbers, the on-base, the walk rate, et cetera, et cetera, all that's going to tick right back up for the Yankees, now the judge is back, assuming he does get activated this evening. Um, and like I said, the, the numbers for everybody else are, are also likely to tick up a little bit quicker because they're going to see better pitches, you know, because guys are generally pretty damn afraid of Aaron Judge, and rightfully so. Um, I'm on Grayson here a little bit at 6,300. I, I like... I, I really, really like this changeup, man. And even though the, the fastball value, I think this is a tad bit noisy um, so far. Cutter value, perhaps not you know noisy in the in the raw value that he's he's getting out of it. Um, you know, but a hard cutter, and it's still a serviceable pitch for him. And he does still have five that he can go to work with. Obviously, giving up a lot of equity here on the curveball cutter and a four seamer 
uh, in aggregate, it's a slider change where all of this swing and miss comes from. And I think that can put him in play. The Yankees are still not a very good offense. Even with Judge, they were about break-even WRC plus relative to the rest of the league. Um, and again, this is in a pretty big ballpark, too. We might have to deal with a little bit of weather, as we you know, often do in Baltimore. Um, you know, so keep an eye out for that. It, it doesn't look like this is like this game may very well get get washed out here. So we might just not have to worry about it, which would be cool. Um, but I, I like some lower ownership here on Grayson, and I think at 6,300, there's upside for him that is not priced in due to the really really good two pitch breaking arsenal here. Um, you know, excluding curveball, obviously, that can induce a lot of swing and miss. And Stanton, Judge, these guys are still going to strike out a little bit. Harrison Bader's still going to strike out, um, et cetera, et cetera. Jake Bauer's still going to strike out. You know, so the, the, the lineup's still attackable, even though they got uh, their best hitter back. So um, if I got to choose between the two, yeah, it's just give me Grayson. He's at the same ownership. He, he, obviously, you know, things are not totally black and white here. Um you know, but he's 4,700 cheaper. I think that's a, a pretty good value save, uh, if I do say mo say so myself, on a 14-game slate. All right, let's move on. Um, I don't really want much of offense at all in that game, um, but sure, you want to play Judge, go ahead. Uh, or really into the Yankees. If you want to stack against Grayson in those bad numbers, yeah, that's okay. Let's move on. Um, Philly and Pittsburgh. I think both of these arms here, Zach Wheeler and Mitch Keller, are probably a tad overpriced for the particular matchups. Now, Pittsburgh did trade Carlos Santana. Um, and, well, who they're filling him in with, right, filling that gap with is Jimin Choi, and he's got fantastic numbers against right-handers this year. Zach Wheeler, 9,800. I'm a little concerned, number one, with this price tag in this particular matchup. I do still like Pittsburgh a little bit, power-wise, um, against right-handed pitching. Now, this is Zach Wheeler, and you know, obviously you know, Wheeler is, is certainly the uh, the ace anymore of the Philly staff. He's one of the you know top ten arm in baseball still. However, he's got some problems here with the slider curveball in the, in the breaking arsenal. Not so much with the slider. Now he's throwing this pitch a lot, of course, but the curveball is giving up a lot of equity to the field. And he can get taken apart a little bit to lefties. That's how is he is more susceptible. It's not like the numbers here are bad. He'll give up a little bit more average, 264 to them. That's a, you know, a, a figure we need to uh, be aware of. 264 is not, uh, not nothing. It's not something, necessarily, but it's not nothing. 314, whoa, but that's a good number. He's not going to walk anybody, six, just 6% 6 walk rate. to give up a lot of power, so he's not overly attackable. I don't want to stack Pittsburgh, necessarily, but he does give up some flying balls, right? 085 here with a 35% hard contact rate and a 23% line drive rate, give or take. That means that's a little bit attackable, right? With a 264 batting average allowed, I think Pittsburgh could hit for a little bit of average here, even though the fastball mix with the four-seamer, two-seamer is still pretty damn good for Wheeler. He's break-even at best, you know, with the breaking stuff. Does still have swing and miss, of course, to the right side. I don't want any right-handers here really whatsoever. Uh, he's elite over there. Induces more ground balls, far less hard contact, far more soft contact. And the soft contact, uh, I guess, figure here to, at, at a full 22% is really what would take me off of full, like, Pittsburgh stacks. Can we get a little bit of leverage here? Yeah, I think so with some Sawinski, maybe a G-Man Choi because he's got great numbers against righties, as I mentioned. Uh, Brian Reynolds, don't really want to be playing him 4,700 necessarily. Endy, uh, behind the plate, you could play a 2,200. Just switch hit and catcher with very high upside hit tool. Um, that's fine. If you want to play some short stacks, getting a little bit of leverage on Wheeler here. This is a tough ballpark, though. It's only 80 degrees at PNC tonight. Um, you need, even though it will play up left-handed power a little bit more than right-handed power, it's still just a, a total black hole for right-handers. Um, you know, you need it a little bit warmer weather-wise to really start seeing the baseball fly. And, you know, this is Zach Wheeler. It's not like he's a total trash can. 9,800, however, I think given how much contact he's likely to pitch to against the left side of the plate in particular, I think it's maybe a little fishy high. Um, 
I'd rather pivot to some other guys up in up in the range, but I think you know playing Wheeler against Pittsburgh, like you're not going to get much of an argument from me uh, for the most part. Plate discipline numbers are still uh, pretty damn good overall for Wheeler. We need some more CSW out of him, um, you know. But we got some positive sort of strand rate regression coming to him for sure, and that could certainly you know begin or continue to. Um, you know, materialize here against Pittsburgh tonight because it's just not overly efficient and offense, right? Just an 87 WRC plus here and a 230 batting average against right-handers. So um, one-offs and maybe some short stacks here or there just for some leverage purposes against Wheeler, but, you know, not a, a top priority really by any means. Mitch Keller, for them, I think he's also kind of overpriced. You know, this changeup, he's, he's just losing more and more value on it uh, every time the, the damn guy starts. I wish he just totally stop throwing it um he doesn't need six pitches because he's got five and he's okay in the breaking arsenal but same thing with wheeler i mean these numbers are damn near identical here uh in terms of you know value not so much in the usage right because um mitch keller does have the cutter that he throws and wheeler moves all of that usage over the four seamer um you know, but for the most part, these arsenals here are very similar, and I think the matchups are pretty similar. I, I respect Philly's offense a little bit more, of course, right? With it, in terms of power, with Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Castellanos, JTR, uh, Alec Boehm, a little bit of Bryson Stott, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't necessarily like stacking against Mitch Keller. Um, I still really, uh, it's not like I respect the the the. the secondary arsenal here or anything uh, i really respect the fastball arsenal i've talked about this ad nauseum this season um but i think he could still induce a good bit of swing and miss with this slider for example i mean kyle schwarber's gonna strike out a crap load he's probably price adjusted the best play i think from the phillies here tonight if you want to go after him because it is going to be a lefty that you're going to target um mitch keller with right 256 batting average there for him as well 335 woba 8% walk rate, it's not that. So we're not necessarily worried that Schwarber's just going to you know, walk every single at bat. But it's a 206 ISO. He will strike some guys out here, of course. right? He does still induce that swing and miss. So I'm not overly thrilled about playing a lot of the Phillies here. Um, same thing with Bryce Harper. He's at his normal price tag. I think this is kind of a down matchup. His power numbers are really down against right-handers this year, too, even though he's still hitting for a lot of average. Um you know, Trey Turner's been dreadful against right-handers all season. Bryson Stott doesn't strike out. He's okay at 4,100. If you want to mix in, like, a little short three-man lefty stack with, with Schwarber, Harper, and, and Bryson Stott, I think that's all right. I don't want to play JTR, though. He's just right-handed in PNC at 4,800 against, you know, a pretty damn good righty. Doesn't give up any power whatsoever. So no Trey Turner, no Castellanos, no JTR, no Alec Baum. It's lefties only if we go after Mitch Keller. So I think I approach this game the same way, really, on both sides. P little pitching. If I had to choose, it'd just be Mitch Keller, right? Because he's 3% owned versus Zach Wheeler, 20% owned. Um, I know that the projections and everything are, are far different. Fundamentally, I don't see all that much of a difference here. Mitch Keller, I like that he's going to induce more ground balls. You know, yeah, you might get taken apart by a Schwarber here or there. But Zach Wheeler might get taken apart by Jack Sawinski or G. Choi uh, or something like that. Endy or Brian Reynolds. Even Andrew McCutcheon is a pretty respectable hitter against right-handed pitching still. You know, so uh, for the most part, short stacks and, and singleton pieces here for me. Um, maybe a little bit of pitching, I think, if I land on it. But not overly thrilled at their particular price tags. I think a lot of the upside is kind of priced in. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Angels, Toronto. As I mentioned, no Giolito here for the Angels, I don't think. I mean, DraftKings might screw around and put him in the player pool. Uh, who knows? But you can't do anything with him right now. Uh, we can at least analyze uh, what's going on with Giolito. Um, this game's in Toronto. Hitters ballpark, of course. And Giolito's still a fly baller. Uh, most notably to left-handers. Far more traditional split this season than last year when he was getting destroyed by righties. Um, it's a break-even change. That's really getting him taken apart by the left side of the plate. Um, now, Toronto, of course, doesn't have a hell of a lot of lefties, right? Just the three, maybe four, if they throw in a Kevin Biggio. They should, but who knows what they're going to do. Leave Witt off and play Kevin Biggio instead of second base. But, um, you know, Schneider just kind of clicks buttons up there sometimes. Um, Brandon Belt, of course, 3,200. He's only 
first base eligible, however. Uh, it's a fine price tag, and he still hits the baseball in the air. So that's batted ball-wise, not the greatest necessarily. He's a high fly ball hitter. He will hit for a little bit of power, but he's still going to strike out a crap load too. He's striking out at like 27 28% clip against righties this year. Um, so not my favorite play there, and I don't really want to play Dalton Varsho either. He strikes out a lot, and the numbers are way, way down for him, at least to expectations. Kevin Kiermeyer, not all that high an upside bat from the left side either. Um, so I would have to side with Giolito you know, in the downside of his platoon, even though he gives up a boatload of production here, 231 ISO to lefties, 10% walk rate, two homers per nine, and 045 ground balls per fly ball. That's pretty significant. Um, but he's still going to be able to throw it past those three lefties, even four if it's Kevin Biggio that they have in there. Uh, so I'm not overly worried about it. It's obviously the right-handers here. He still gives up a 180 ISO and a neutral ground ball to fly ball to the right side. Not so much in batting average, so it's really just kind of homer hunting and power hunting uh, with Giolito and barrels, right? He has a 10% barrel rate. It is not horrible, right? But it, it is elevated. Anything pushing 10% is a significant figure that we need to be aware of. Um, now, Toronto over here, they're not going to barrel the baseball all that often, even though they do create a pretty at a pretty respectable clip, 109 WRC+. Plus few strikeouts 21 and a half percent it's the power where they really kind of struggle a little bit uh 165 ice so they're a, they're a very dangerous offense against right-handed pitching though and g little's going to give up some balls in the air and on a line here a little bit 20 percent right at uh a line drive rate here so that does certainly play into Toronto's strength, and of course they have a couple of lefties they can't throw in there. It's not like Gilito is totally infallible against the left side, even though he will induce whiffs. Um, so even if Gilito were in the player pool at 9,600, which is where he's priced, I would likely just be staying off him. I'd pivot that straight to Mitch Keller and and take shots there instead, even though they'd, they'd both be uh, probably similarly popular. Um I don't want to go after Toronto. I'd much rather go after Philly. In any case, I still don't, you know, want to stack Toronto necessarily. Uh, they're, they're kind of normal price tags. And for the most part, this is, you know, an average to below average matchup. Uh, so I don't really want to go out of my way to be playing a lot of Toronto. Springer at 48, his numbers are way down. Bobby has been great all season, but he's at his normal 5,300. Not my favorite shortstop playing a 14 gamer. Same thing with Vladdy. Maybe heating up a little bit. 5,100's fine there. But if you're stacking Toronto, now you got to choose between him and Brandon Belt, um, you know, and you got to make decisions. If you want to get exposure to both of them, well, now all of a sudden you're stacking several Toronto teams against a pretty good arm over here in Giolito uh, on a 14-game slate. So probably not my favorite personally. Um, Matt Chapman here from the right side, if you're going to target a third base one-off play, 4,600, I think that's a pretty good target. Um, he's a Pretty strong fly ball hitter here, and I think that matches up pretty well against Giolito in particular from the right side if I've got to choose one guy. But, um, you know, overall, just kind of lukewarm on the Jays. Kevin Gosman's going for them, 10-8. I think this is fine. I'd much rather play Gosman than uh, Garrett Cole, and the field would too, right? Uh, about three times as much, as a matter of fact. Um, I got no problems here in the plate discipline for Kevin Gosman. He's at a 30% CSW. The chase rate's way, way down this year. This was, you know, nearing 40% last season. It's not like it's a bad figure. 33% is still great. 63% strike one, no walks. The problem with Gosman here, though, this season is an 11% barrel rate. So if you want to get off of both of these guys, again, you can't play Giolito. I don't know why I keep saying that. Um, if you want to get off of Gosman, yeah, this is an 11% barrel rate. This is not nothing, man. A 171 realized ISO to the left side of the plate, 38% hard contact, and an 090 ground ball to fly ball. That's attackable, absolutely. He's got a 90 mile an hour average exit velo. This is not one of the best numbers in the league. So despite a pretty low contact rate here, 73%, excellent plate discipline with swing and miss, I think you can make an argument for getting off of Kevin Gosman and playing an angel or two, notably Shohei Otani. I'm not playing Mickey Moniak at 4,900. That's just a total non-starter. Um, you want to play a Trey Cabbage? Dual eligible, at least, so you don't have to play him at sole first base. That's okay. 2,100. That'll make some a lot of things happen for you. You want to play Moose? Dual eligible at first and third base? I wouldn't play him at first base. It would be at third. He's 3,000 and probably be in the five hole. I mean, okay. 
it's a little bit of an upside spot for him because he still hits some ground balls, has some pop. Um, that wouldn't be the worst if you want to play a short stack there. Same thing with a Matt Dice behind the plate, 3,200. He'd be in the six hole, and he's hitting from the left side. So that's okay. I don't want a single right-hander here. Um, you know, no Zach Neto, no Taylor Ward, Hunter Renfro, any of this nonsense. Um, I don't want any of that because he's fantastic is Gosman against the right side. Even though he gives up hard contact there, he gets way more ground balls and far more strikeouts, right? Gives up way less power and even less batting average, right? So um, it's lefties only here if you want to, you know, hunt against Gosman and it's Shohei for sure. 6,500, he's always the favorite um, from the Angels. So, yeah, go ahead. But for the most part, kind of off of pretty much everything here, Gosman definitely, I, I do like um, going after the Angels here. There's still going to be some strikeouts to be had. And this is Gosman. He's still one of the better arms in baseball. I had no problem playing him. 30% ownership at 10-8. I probably could make an argument to come off and pivot to some cheaper builds, um, you know, at least in the, in the couple of pitcher spots that we have uh, to get to some more expensive offenses. Okay, let's move on. Washington and the Mets. Mackenzie Gore, 7,300. I think he's in play here. Um, you know, not a great projection here. I really do like the ownership, of course. Value score is, is it's fine. It's nothing to be super impressed with necessarily at, at you know, 25 here in the mid 7K range. Um, you know, overall, the plate discipline is okay. He has trouble throwing strikes later in the counts, not necessarily strike one. It's the control and, and the command. He's throwing too much of this fastball, too. 60% of one pitch is concerning when you don't have an off-speed pitch. He's got swing and miss, right? The 28% Ks uh, are nothing to sneeze at, of course. This is why I think he's in play, even against a, the Mets in a down matchup. Um, he's got a good breaking arsenal. It's a break-even curveball, but a, a pretty damn good slider here. What I do need from him is, you know, to jack up the the csw um is an off-speed pitch right we he needs to develop out this change or introduce a cutter or something you can't just main 60 percent of one pitch you're gonna get, get taken apart doesn't matter how good your breaking stuff is so that's why mckenzie gore has been giving up some power this season 186 x iso uh it's really to both sides of the plate he's running probably a little bit hot in that respect uh it's not a perfect you know calculation here it's not weighted for number of hitters faced um, but this average is 166, so he's running about 2% hot in the batted ball expectation. 262 XBA with a 342 X Woba. These are very much attackable figures. Um, so you can play some of the Mets and go after Mackenzie Gore, even though he does have swing and miss. He does still have a 10% walk rate and an 11% barrel rate himself. I think some of that is starting to get priced in here with Mackenzie Gore. He's not up in the up, you know 9,000s like he was earlier in the season. Uh, when we also considered playing him, you know, th it's because of the swing and miss. He's got good swing and miss. He induces a lot of ground balls to the left side still. Um, you know, but he's got some walk problems. That's mostly the lefties, which is you know, kind of an issue here because he's got the good slider value. He should be able to um, tone this walk rate down against same-handed hitters. It's a little noisy, though, just 100 guys that he's seen. Right, and that's what, 14 walks, 15 walks or something? I mean, it's not a... a Super concerning number over this type of sample. Um, mostly attackable with right-handers, though. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, 35% hard contact. And you can play some of the Mets. Do I want to do that on a 14-game slate? Not particularly. Uh, you can play always play PD. Um, numbers are way down. But, you know, power is still there, of course. Frankie Lindor, still at 4,800. Still kind of expensive as a shortstop on a 14-gamer. There he might do some shenanigans in the two-hole. Have, like, a Mark Vientos since... Um, Starling Marte is still out. Tommy Pham's had a pretty good season against lefties. You could play him at 3,300 if you mix in some Met stacks. I think that's fine and playable. Everybody down at the bottom of the lineup, I mostly want to stay off of. Um, Frankie Alvarez is going to strike out a lot in this matchup. Not my favorite catcher piece at 38 down in the 8 hole or whatever on a home team. So not my favorite playing the Mets here, um, even though the numbers for Mackenzie Gore are certainly attackable. I think I'd prefer just, like, short stacks, but I don't really like the price tags necessarily. I'd like for PD to be a little bit cheaper um, if we could get it, even though he's, you know, is going to hover right around a $5,000 price tag, as he really should. But Frankie Lindor, I think a little bit pricey. Um, you know, there are guys that will make the 
the aggregate cheaper for you targeting some Mackenzie Gore here. But uh, overall, it's kind of lukewarm on the Mets. I don't like playing the offense because they're not a very good offense. Um, it's hard for them to get there on a, a full 14-game slate like this. Uh, Scherzer on the mound for New York, 9,400. It's kind of bleh. Uh, you know, um, I like the plate discipline. Everything is ticking back up for Scherzer, but he's got a pretty significant swing and miss split here uh, with right-handers versus lefties. Um, just a 22.5% strikeout rate against the left side, 32.5% to the righties. So he's still very, very good there, but he's not throwing it past any of the lefties. Like, where's all the really good change-up value that we've come to know from Scherzer? I mean, he's given up a full out to the field on this change-up here. Um, it's mostly just command. He's spraying it a little bit. This one pitch in particular, right? He's still pretty efficient. He's not walking guys, right? And 70% strike one is still elite. Still a 31% chase and a 28% CSW. That's all fine. We'd love for this to tick up a little bit for Scherzer, but everything is still mostly pretty okay. Um, where he's been attackable this season, I mean, he's a heavy, heavy fly ball pitcher. He's, he's always been that. So if you want to hunt against Scherzer, it's homers, right? He's had a couple outings this season where he's just gotten blasted. He gave up like four homers in his last outing, I, I think, against Boston. He did that earlier in the season. Uh, I forget who it was um, that got him. Maybe Milwaukee, maybe? He gave up like three or something in an inning or whatever. Um, in any case, that's his problem. It's always been a homer problem for Scherzer, and he's got a raw 5% home run rate allowed. That's significant. 10% barrel rate himself. Also attackable. So at 9,400, yeah, he's got a good matchup here against Washington that doesn't create a hell of a lot. But he's a heavy fly ball pitcher, and most of the guys over here on Washington hit a lot of ground balls. And certainly from the left side, they're going to hit a lot of ground balls. It's C.J. Abrams, Jamer. He'll hit it in the air a little bit. So not my favorite necessarily, but he's got the most power from the left side. So you could play him in stacks. Kbert really not a lot of powers, not super thrilling to be playing him at 4,000. But in stacks, he's he's not going to strike out, right? Dom Smith, neutral ground ball to fly ball. Same thing with Corey Dickerson and Luis Garcia. You know, these guys can still make a, a decent bit of contact here in the batter ball profile hitting ground balls and line drives against Scherzer. That puts them in play a little bit. Um, so with high ownership on Scherzer, 9,400, I think the strikeout matchup is quite reduced uh, here against a all of these lefties. They're probably going to have six, maybe even seven lefties in the lineup tonight here against Scherzer. And it's a below average strikeout rate for him. He's more attackable there in it, in in terms of the raw contact rate, right? And so I think I'd like to maybe get to a couple of Nats stacks. Um, what's going to really take me off, though, is, I mean, this is at City Field. We're also going to have some weather to maybe worry about here as well. Not so much as Baltimore, I don't think. But um, I think some contact could play here from the Nationals, notably like a C.J. Abrams um, and Kbert, of course, because he doesn't strike out. Dom Smith, sure, but I don't really want to play him, even at 2,700 on, at sole first base on a 14-game slate. I'm not thrilled about doing this, but I think a couple of these guys could be in play as super deep tournament shot, shots. Um and stacking against a, a pretty popular arm over here in Scherzer. I think it's a fine suppression matchup for him because the offense is still bad, right? And he still has swing and miss. Um, you know, but he might pitch to a little bit more contact here, and I would not be surprised if a Jamer, if he's back, uh, C.J. Abrams, Caber, or a Corey Dickerson, Luis Garcia type, get to him a little bit here today. Um, I don't really want any of the righties, so no Joey Manessis or Lane Thomas or Alex Call or anything, but... Uh, you know, that's where he's given up most of his power, as a matter of fact. So in stacks, Lane Thomas and Joey Manessis are still definitely in play. A lot of fly balls. There's 33% hard contact, two and a half homers per nine to the righties. That's a, These are big figures. 250 ISO is not nothing. Um, you know, on average, he has got about a 200 ISO here. So he's running right in line with where he should be. So I think those numbers suggest that you know, some things could be attackable here with Scherzer. 9,400 seems a little bit fishy. Um, it's it, it's generally okay, but it's mostly the ownership that kind of takes me off. Uh, okay, let's move on to Cleveland and the White Sox. Uh, Xavier Curry here, um, he's just going to go two or three innings, so I don't know what the hell DraftKings is doing over here with this $9,000 price tag. Like, you just can't do anything with this. Um, 
I think the White Sox are going to be in play here a little bit. He gives up a lot of power to the right side, man. Uh, now, this is noisy, of course, but this is a right-hander, and, you know, they've had him kind of in the opener, sort of long relief type of role, so it's not like pure uh, manufactured matchups, as it were, um, you know, where he should be performing quite a bit better against, you know, right-handers. But he's not throwing it past anybody, right? Just 70% raw strikeout rate against the right side. A little bit of problem throwing some strike one. So he sprays it a little bit. And I think that makes him attackable. Just a 9% swinging strike rate here. So with 40% hard contact rates, I mean, this is out of control. He's an 075 ground ball to fly ball guy. I think this has to put the White Sox in play. Now, this is also one of the teams I hate playing on a full slate because they are just dreadful. They do not create at all. And every one of them just hits the baseball on the ground no matter if they're in a good batted ball matchup or not uh however i do kind of like them and you know numbers you just got to continue to play numbers even though uh or you know general numbers like ground ball to play ball ratios lining up pretty well uh even though the team you're doing it with the white Sox over here just absolutely stinks um so my favorites here would probably just have to be like a Tim Anderson. I think it's an intriguing price tag over here a little bit for him tonight at 3,800. Uh, kind of jumped off the page for me. I don't know why, um, but I think this might be an okay spot for him to get off Schneid a little bit. Um, Aloy, of course. Now, uh, Luis Roberts got the most raw upside from a power perspective on the team. Uh, he's 5,900, though, and he's a pure fly ball hitter. Not excellent because Curry's given up an 050 ground ball to fly ball here. I know I am just kind of going a little bit deep into into Curry, but he is probably going to go three innings. So all these guys are, are going to see, you know, I would say at least one at bat um, against Curry, unless he just get totally blasted. They did get Yoan Moncada back. Uh, Eloy is a fine play, of course. As I mentioned, 4,200. Um, Andrew Vaughn, I think, jumps off the page a little bit here as well at 3,600. He's playable. Uh, not so much with the ground doll, but Jake Berger, also playable. Uh, once again, not my favorite, even though he's dual eligible. He's in the eight hole, and he's 3,900, and he hit two bombs yesterday, and he strikes out a crap load. So, um, you know, not my favorite to get there. So I'd rather stick to the top half of the lineup. And, and mix in a couple of these guys if I get to any of the White Sox. Sure, you can mix in Andrew Benintendi, but he doesn't have any power at all. He just doesn't strike out. Uh, he pops every day in value because he's cheap, but there's very little upside for him. Um, but I think some of the White Sox could be in play here. Short stacks, sure, because it's very hard to get there with them on a full slate. But these guys are a little bit healthier now, and I think this could you know, be a, a pretty decent matchup. But keep in mind that this is a bullpen game. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes for Cleveland, and that generally favors the pitching staff as opposed to the offense. So uh, not my favorite getting to the White Sox, but I think they kind of have to be in play. They're actually popping in value scores here, um, you know, quite a bit higher and surprisingly high for the White Sox on a 14-gamer. So uh, Tuki Toussaint is on the mound for them. There's just no chance we go near Tuki. Uh, he has a lot of strikeouts to the right side in this very short sample this season, but, well... Unfortunately for him, Cleveland's going to have probably seven righties, or excuse me, seven lefties in the lineup. It'll be like a Gabby Arias, a Miles Straw, or something um, from the right side of the plate, and everybody else is a lefty or a switch hitter, and you know they're going to hit from the left side of the plate, so no thanks. He's got a 13% strikeout rate in just an 80-hitter sample uh, against the lefties this season. Sub 50% strike one rate, there's just no chance. Um, probably not going to go deep into the game. I think you can play Cleveland again because he's going to pitch to a lot of contact. He's going to have trouble throwing strikes. He's going to put guys on base for free. And these guys are going to make contact. They've been very good recently. They got there again yesterday against a pretty damn good arm in Dylan Cease. Um, Tuki Tucson is certainly not Dylan Cease. I want to go after them. The WRC Plus for Cleveland you know, continuing to tick up. So uh, I want to target some Tukey here and play a little bit of Cleveland. Again, just short stacks. I can't believe I just said I prefer offense in a Cleveland and White Sox game on a 14-game slate, but I do. And I think both of these teams are in play. Cleveland actually popping as the most valuable um, team in, in the value score today so far. They're obviously cheap. You know, you got to pay for Josie and a little bit of Josh Naylor, 4,400. But everybody else, Stephen Kwan's 42. Everybody else is 4K or less. Um, you know, Jimenez at uh, in the two-hole, now that they don't have Med Rosario there anymore. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, you know, th this makes him playable. 
right, up in the two hole, even though he hits a lot of ground balls still, and Tukey's going to induce ground balls, um, he's still a playable second base piece in the two hole. You just couldn't play him at 4,500 in the six hole or whatever he was. Um, so, yeah, you can play a lot of the, the Guardians here. They're, they're starting to see the baseball a little bit, and you're playing the, the usual suspects here, Jose Ramirez, Josh Naylor. You're not fading either one of those guys. And just throw in Quan Jimenez and a Will Brennan or or a Bo Naylor or something like that. Uh, so I think offense and even some full stacks are going to have to be in play here uh, for Cleveland. We're worried about upside generally because they don't hit it over the wall. So I personally prefer short stacks, but uh, pretty much everything is in play from both sides here, uh, you know, from an offensive perspective. Okay, let's move on. Mil uh, Milwaukee and Atlanta. Adrian Hauser, 5,500. Absolutely not, right? Um, not doing this. 18% strikeout rate. Now, he's fantastic against right-handers, right? 2-0 ground ball to fly ball. It's elite. 0-93 ISO. He does give up a little bit of batting average, but it's not so much in power. It's just singles, right? And sort of C&I ground balls. Um, he has trouble throwing strike one, though, and it elevates his pitch count. So even at a very cheap price tag, number one, we need cheap price tags, right? We need value when we go after Atlanta. And we number two, we need guys that can throw it past people, and Hauser is not that. He's very attackable with right-handers um, in, in terms of just raw batting average. And it, with left-handers, right, in terms of average for sure, but much more so the power there. He gives up a 36% hard contact, and he's an 090 ground ball to fly ball guy there, right? That's the lack of a real good swing and miss and off-speed pitch. He's mostly four-seamer, two-seamer. The two-seamer is what's getting him into trouble against the left side of the plate here. 183 ISO, just an 18% strikeout rate, and those fly balls. So 1.7 homers per nine is certainly a, an attackable figure. As I said, he's not going to walk a lot of guys, but he will elevate the pitch count and put himself into some pretty difficult spots. So I think that, once again, has to put Atlanta in play. It's like every damn night, even when they have a bad matchup, they get there, but when they have a, a pretty good matchup, um, you know, they just get there in spades and they perform every single night. So you got to have exposure. Uh, you got to play them. It, even at their price tags, you just kind of can't avoid it. Um, Ozzy Albies here, even though his, you know, raw on base and batting average numbers are dreadful against right-handed pitching, uh, he still has a lot of power there. And he's got like 15, 16 jacks against righties this year from the left side of the plate, only hitting 200. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, the power is there. He's 5,600 still. That's fine. You can always play Acuna and Austin Riley up to 6,000 now. I don't really want to deal with this. Um, he's got a slight ground ball lean, as a matter of fact, even though the power is there. Uh, I don't want to play a lot of the righties necessarily. Um, Acuna, I, I would play at 66. I think he's still underpriced. And as I mentioned, they are going to hit for a little bit of average here. Um, but when we're targeting very expensive guys, we're going to need a little bit more creation than Austin Riley provides because for the most part, he doesn't hit for a hell of a lot of average. It's just mostly power. Um, and it's a down matchup, right, in the in the platoon. Matt Olson, I'd probably like to stay off of him at 6,400. It, it, it certainly is one-offs. Um, I mean, it's okay, you know, super contrarian play. He, he won't be all that popular, but... The walk rate here for Hauser against left-handers is pretty high, and Matt Olson walks a lot. So at 6,400, certainly not my favorite play. I'd rather play like a, uh, a Freddie Freeman at 62, who we will get to. Um, Sean Murphy, 5,700 from behind the plate. Like, no thanks. You know, even though he's a fly ball hitter, it's 5,700 for a catcher on a 14-gamer. Tough to stomach. Favorite's going to have to be like an Eddie Rosario or a Michael Harris. But now we're all of a sudden playing seven and nine-hole hitters. Uh, as one-offs in singleton pieces or in short stacks, um, you know, on home teams and big favorites here. I mean, it's kind of a gross construction, right? So as we know, when the Braves get there, they have to hit the baseball over the wall. This is a good spot for them to do that, but I think Adrian Hauser could suppress some contact here because he induces so many ground balls. Um, so that would, once again, just put me under short stacks of the Braves where they're well-priced. It'd have to be like an Acuna Albies and a Michael Harris little 912 wraparound or something. I think that's intriguing, uh, or however you want to construct it. Otherwise, you could play them all. Let's not get it confused. But um, not my favorite getting to full stacks here because of this very high ground ball rate and suppression in power to the right side. Still a lot of righties over here for Atlanta. Yanni Chirinos, we're not playing him either. Uh, 6,600, probably just going to go, I don't know, three, four innings. He's kind of stretched out for to be a starter. But he's got a 7% swing strike rate. Um, even against Milwaukee, I, I don't really want to deal with this. 12% 
K's. I mean, this is why Tampa got rid of him. You just need swing and miss, and we're just not going to deal with that. He's got a 4-0 ERA in just his short 15 appearances out of the bullpen and, you know, a few starts here. But he's got a 540 XFIP, right? That's an, a run and a half worth of regression coming to him um, just in terms of the, the raw, you know, production. So I want to go after him with both sides of the plate if I can. Um you know, the problem is I don't really like the price tags of the Brewers. I don't really like the offense. So if I have to choose full stacks here, it's, it's just got to be the Brewers. I'd like to go after Chirinos instead of Atlanta, and they're a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, but, like, Willie Contreras, 4800 not great. 5000 for Willie Adamas now, not great. 54 for Yelich is also not great, even though he makes hard contact. He's still going to hit a lot of ground balls here. It's very attackable. Yanni gives up 46% hard contact to the left side. So, yeah, go ahead and play Yelich. That's fine. He still makes 49 or 50 percent hard contact himself. Um, Free lick in the outfield, 3400 price adjusted. That's got to be the best play from the left side at least. Um, so yeah, you had short stacks again. I think it, down here in Atlanta uh, with both Milwaukee and the Braves. I think that's fine. No pitching really for me, um, but kind of a, a goofy tournament game. I think you're probably going to have to get it right um, to perform pretty well tonight. Should see some offense there. Okay, Tampa and Houston. Shane McClanahan, probably unlikely to see a hell of a lot of offense here, but I don't know, maybe a little bit from Tampa. Uh, McClanahan, though, in this particular matchup, now that Houston's got Jose Altuve and Jordan Alvarez back, um, I want to stay off of this. I I just can't do it. I don't want to stack Houston or anything because they're very expensive, and I really respect McClanahan, of course. But he's got a 10% walk rate, 10% barrel rate himself. You know, so these are attackable figures. 84% strand rate's too high, right? He's got a 290 ERA with a 390 XFIP. So we got some some noise coming in here from McClanahan. It's been overperforming a little bit. Um, he's always been elite against, you know, the, the left side of the plate. A lot of swing and miss, of course, against the righties, too. So that's fine. But Houston, you're, are you ready for this? Sub-18% strikeout rate in, in 1,000 PAs against lefties this season, buck 10 WRC plus, and they got Altuve and Jordan Alvarez back. Um, so Jeremy Pena is not really striking out all that much against left-handed pitching this year. Um, Chaz McCormick, he has been fantastic. He's got a, like a, a thousand OPS, uh, against lefties. Let's, uh, let's see exactly what it is. Um, uh, just doing some quick calculations here. Yeah, it's a 1042 OPS, uh, against left-handers this season. And he's 4,100 in the seven hole. Uh, like Josie Abreu kind of stinks anymore, but um, Bregman doesn't strike out. Tucker really doesn't strike out. Jordan Alvarez, Jordan Alvarez, you know. So this is a really, really difficult lineup to get through now. And so I'm just going to leave a lot of McClanahan on the shelf. I think it, he should be kind of ignored here today. This is a difficult matchup for him. Now he's coming off an outing where he got taken apart. Um, last, what, three, four innings against, uh, who was it, uh, looking it up here, yeah, it was Baltimore, they got to him, gave up five earned, and that was at home in Tampa, this is in Houston, smaller ballpark, and when you give up power and some more fly balls to right-handers, you don't want to be jacking around with that in Houston, 35% hard contact too, uh, it's not so much in batting average or anything, you know, but he will give up some, some fly balls and some pop, and doesn't have to go all that far to, make it into the Crawford boxes down here. So I'm going to leave him off the shelf or on the shelf rather and off the table um, at 10, four today. I think he's a bit too expensive and the upside is really kind of priced out. Um, 8,600 for Christian Javier on the mound. I want to stack Tampa. I'll tell you this much. Like he's got a 16% strikeout rate against the left side. Like what on earth? This was 30% last year. Where is all of the, the strikeouts? So it's just totally gone for Javier. He's got a break-even four-seamer now where he used to induce a lot of swing and miss. Same thing with the slider. It's mostly against the right side now. So I don't want to play any righties whatsoever, even though you can mix him a couple of these guys in in stacks, like at Isak Paredes, who they play against right-handers a lot. Harold Ramirez, they might throw him in there uh, as well. They do it sometimes against righties. They give up uh, a good bit of production to right-handers. And Christian Javier certainly does that, right? 035 ground ball to fly ball. That's a stupidly high number, or a low number, I guess. You know, stupidly high fly ball rate. And a 40% hard contact rate. So that's against the right side. Once again, this is in Houston. 
uh, with a short ports in left field. So let's do it. I want to go after Javier because he only strikes out 16% against lefties, of the, or of left-handers, I should say, with a 200 ISO there, 060 ground ball to fly ball. What we'd really like to be, um, you know, what we'd really like to see, I, sh- I should say, um, against well, we're with Christian Javier against the left side of the plate would be the hard contact ratio. We need this uh, a little bit higher, right, to be in just like total slam the table sort of mode. Yeah, we're stacking everybody against him. I'm still going to stack Tampa. I think he's a really sneaky spot. Um, I think he's a good spot going after Javier, even though he gives up so many fly balls and you generally want right-handers in Houston against um, – you know, from an offensive perspective, he's still got trouble elevating his own pitch count. So I want nothing to do with him at, at 8,600. I think he's 7% uh, too popular here, to be quite honest. Um, even against Tampa, who has cooled off you know, quite significantly, their price tags have finally started to correct. The only expensive guys, Wander, is still 5,700 um, for some stupid reason. I know he's stealing bases, but like 5,700 is too expensive for him. That said, I want to play him in stacks today. Uh, Randy Orozarena, he's 5,500, starting to see the price tag drift down a little bit, and Josh Lowe, 4,500 uh, as well. Um, Luke Rayleigh's maybe a little stiff price tag for him at 42, but I really like this spot for him, batted ball-wise. Same thing with Brandon Lau at 4,100. Really like that also. Uh, and I want to play Isak. I want to play some Harold Ramirez. So I want to play a good bit of Tampa here and go after some Houston. I think it's a pretty damn good spot. Really contrarian stack. Um... You know, they're way, way down the uh, the list in terms of, you know, value scores here, mostly because of the Wanda Franco, Randy Rosarena price tags. But, um, you know, I think it's a pretty damn good spot for them to make a lot of contact and get after some Christian Javier. I generally don't like stacking against Houston because their bullpen's very good. But if I can get a starter out of the game in three innings or something against Javier, it, it I... I'm going to jump on that uh, pretty much every single time. So no pitching here for me, um, which is maybe a little bit surprising. No Houston because they're way too expensive, and I still really respect McClanahan. And I want to play a lot of Tampa, so let's do it. Okay, Minnesota, Kansas City. Uh, Sonny Gray, 9,300. Man, his results this season have just been kind of terrible. Uh, even though the swing and miss is still there against the right side, it's totally gone against the left side, similar to Christian Javier. Um, but Javier didn't... Or, uh, Sonny Gray, that is, doesn't give up near as much power as Javier. Um, 085 ISO with 20 ground balls per fly ball for Sonny. That has to put him in play despite the very low strikeout rate against the lefties. Royals are going to have probably five, six lefties in the lineup. Um, but, you know, earlier this season, one of Sonny Gray's best starts, of course, did come against the Royals, unsurprisingly. He's got six pitches, of course, as we've talked about all season with Sonny, you know, kind of break even ish in the four seamer, two seamer, getting a good bit of value with the cutter, certainly with the slider. Those are his two uh, real money making pitches here. But he's got a plus curveball plus changeup, right? So I think the Royals can struggle quite significantly here. It's just a, a strikeout rate um, or strikeout upside that we really need to target for Sonny Gray. 9,300, eh, I think it's kind of priced in a little bit, but at super low ownership, that kind of puts me right back on to him. And I think overall, if you are fading right-handers against the Royals, uh, you're probably going to get burnt more often than not. So, yeah, I'll, let me just play Sonny Gray. And if he has a 14-point outing, as he has done, you know, kind of ad nauseum this season uh, against the Royals, then, I mean, I guess he just kind of does it. Uh, but we run into that kind of variance here with Sonny sometimes, um, spraying it a little bit and walking some guys. But uh, overall, I, I want to play some Sonny here. And I think at very low ownership, I think it's pretty good tournament play. I want to play the Twins, too, because I don't want to play Brady Singer. He's got awful numbers against both righties and lefties this year in terms of power allowed. He's running cold, probably, oh, I don't know, you know, tick and a half cold or so, um, with just a 173 X ISO versus a you know, roughly average 185 ISO. Um, but he's not throwing it past anybody, and that's really the main weakness for the Twins over here. I'm going to continue to play Eddie Julian literally every single night against a right-hander. He's still 3,300 until they jack his price up. I'm going I'm to keep playing it. Same with Alex Kirilov. He's still 2,700. Max Kepler still 2,800. Buxton should be back off of the paternity list. He's 52. You can even mix him in tonight, even though he stinks, because he's not going to strike out a hell of a lot, even though he probably still will. Brady Singer's not going to strike him out necessarily. Uh, with just an 18% K rate against the right side. Singer giving up a lot of power, man. A lot of ground balls. 
right to the right side in particular at 220, so I don't generally want to play right-handers. But Buxton's a very heavy fly ball hitter, so I think that matches up pretty well here, uh, especially with the hard contact. And certainly a 40% hard contact rate against left side and a 190 ISO realized allowed, um, they're going to have seven lefties in the lineup, and they likely get Georgie Polanco back tonight. He is only at second base still, but he'll have his third base eligibility here in the next couple of days, rest assured. Um, so do I want to play Michael Taylor, Christian Vasquez in stacks? Yeah, sure. You want to play a Correa in stacks? Yeah, I'm not going to one-off him necessarily, Correa. Um, but yeah, let's get to the Twins. I mean, they're right up there with Cleveland as the top two value stacks of the day so far. So um, I want to play pretty much all of Minnesota here in... Dollar seventy, you got to lay on them in a betting market. It's maybe a little fishy there, but uh, still probably a pretty good play if you are laying a dollar seventy on anybody that gets Royals every single day. They are garbage. Okay, let's move on. I don't want any Kansas City. To, let's just get rid of that. Um, Chicago and St. Louis. Drew Smiley likely going for the Cubs. Fifty-seven hundred. This is a pretty damn good price tag here. He's not in the seven, eight, nine thousands like he was earlier in the year. Uh, throwing the cutter a lot more. Earlier in the season, he was just two-seamer curveball, and that's where he was making all of his money. It was mostly the curveball, but that's just break-even, and we've talked about this a couple of times with him. The value on this pitch is is tanking, really. Um, so I don't want to be dealing with a lot of this with a declining uh, declining value in a you know really his only secondary pitch. He does have the cutter now, which is keeping the right-handers off the board a little bit more. But he's still just throwing a two-seamer, and that's his only other fastball. So these aren't swing and miss pitches. The, the swing and miss just not going to be there for us, certainly against the Cardinals. Um, so I think this is a fine spot to go play some St. Louis if you want to do It's still 100 degrees in freaking uh, St. Louis tonight. So go ahead if you want. And Drew Smiley's kind of a fly ball lean, certainly against the right side of the plate with an 0-70. Uh, 24% line drive rate, that's absolutely attackable. I think the Cardinals are a very good stack here, too. A little bit contrarian. Don't pop as hard in value as, you know, like Cleveland or Minnesota because they're expensive, right? Goldschmidt, Arenado, uh, you still got to pay for these guys. But everybody else uh, is very cheap. I mean, Brendan Donovan is the most expensive. He's 3600 Right, everybody else is 35 or less. Tyler O'Neill likely in the four hole at 3,500. Jordan Walker in the five at 3,000 flat. So I think you can go after a little bit of Drew Smiley here with the Cardinals. Still a very strong offense, 110 WRC plus, and a 165 ISO against left-handed pitching. A lot of hard contact still, 261 average. Suppose I could scroll over and give you guys a look. 39% hard contact. That's a stupidly high number for a team aggregate. Um. 261 batting average is really, really strong. Now, we do have to keep in mind, as I mentioned at the outset today, that uh, you know, there's been some names floating around that could be on the trade block. And surprisingly, it's Nolan Arenado that could be one of them. Um, he's got to waive his no-trade clause, and I think there's only one team in baseball he'd do that for, and that is the Dodgers. Well, good news, the Dodgers are, are the one team that's been in on Arenado talk so far. So yeah, we're in hug watch mode, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so be careful if you get a lot of exposure to some of these players, um, you know, be, you gotta be on top of things here. Um, in any case, pretty, pretty unlikely that the Cardinals trade him, but who knows? I mean, they're dreadful, right? 12 games under and they're not going anywhere this season. So I want to go after some Drew Smiley. Is he in play at 5,700? I mean, probably not for me. I, I think the, the swing and miss and the power allowed here are just a, a bit too aggressive. So no, thank you. Jordan Montgomery, I do like this a little at 8,100. I'm generally worried with Montgomery about just raw upside, right? Unimpressive strikeout rate. And the Cubs tonight, they're going to platoon very heavily. They're going to have probably eight righties in the lineup, and they can do it. You know, with a lot of guys that have some power here. Patty Wisdom, he strikes out a lot, but he's got pop. Chris Morrell, same sort of deal. Dansby will strike out a little bit, but uh, he's had a pretty respectable season. He's 4,600 in the five hole. Um, then you got Nico who doesn't strike out. Seiya up at the top is at still 3,100. Ian Happ hits from the right side. The only lefty they're likely to have in there is Cody Bellinger, so we're not going to be touching him. But if you want to play some of the Cubs, I think that's okay also. Uh, even though Jordan Montgomery is a very good arm, I really do respect him. His problem is two right-handers in terms of just raw contact. 34% hard contact, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball with a 175 ISO. These are not nothing figures, not super concerning, but 
they're notable, you know. And if you want to stack the Cubs, I mean, probably not. I'd just side with the Cardinals here if I'm playing offense in this game. But you can play a piece here or there where they are well-priced. You're not going to get a lot of leverage on it because Montgomery's not all that popular. That's probably why I'd just side with him. But in tournaments, I think I'd maybe like to go elsewhere um, just because I'm always concerned with upside for him in general. And they're going to platoon really heavily here tonight. So And it's very, very hot. Um, so if you want to stack this game, yeah, you could. there's well-priced guys here, certainly on both sides, that could make that happen. I think it's an intriguing game stack if you want to go after it. Okay, let's move on. Oakland and Colorado. Uh, we're going kind of long, but we got a lot of games here. Trying to speed it up as, as best we can. Uh, J.P. Sears, absolutely not. Uh, I think he's a really good spot for Colorado. 6,200 for Sears, no thanks. Good strike one, good chase, right? Uh, these no, the underlying metrics are always or have always you know been okay for him. It's the freaking barrel rate, man. 12.5% barrel rate. Uh, you just cannot do this. He is a heavy fly ball pitcher. Right at Coors Field when it's pushing 90 degrees tonight. Uh, no, thank you. He gives up way too many barrels, way too many fly balls, way too much power. Um, even though he's got some swing and miss against the right side, and the Rockies are absolutely atrocious against lefties in general. 72 WRC plus, but he'll still hit for a little bit of average here. 240. It's not great, but it it's average. They just don't create a hell of a lot because they don't hit it over the wall. But there's 35% hard contact and 22% line drives with a 160 ISO. These are average numbers, even though their creation isn't really there. Um, it's opportunistic or lack of opportunistic uh, production for the Rockies and the fact that they just don't hit it you know, over the wall. But they do hit it down the line in a gap a little bit. It's notably Zeke Tovar. I think he's the best shortstop play of the day. Um, I love playing this kid, and everybody else from the Rockies, from the right side, is pretty damn respectable, certainly against left-handers this season. Jerry Profar's numbers are okay. C.J. Crone, maybe he's back tonight. I mean, maybe he's still hurt. Who knows? Um, Chris Bryant is out with a fractured finger for a little while. Uh, shocking. Um, Randall Grichik, fantastic numbers against lefties this season, 4,100. Elleris Montero, who they just brought up, probably going to be doing the platoon shenanigans with him and Michael Tolia. Um... And he had a bomb the other day, so he's probably going to be in the lineup here tonight. Alan Treos had some good results since he came back up at 3,400. That's fine. Brenton Doyle is a fine speed piece down at the bottom of the lineup at 3,000. I think everybody from the Rockies is in play. I think, um, you know, if I got to choose here, I think the Rockies are probably the best stack of the day uh, going after JP Sears. This barrel rate and this fly ball rate in a very warm day at Coors Field tonight, um, you know, this is a... a pretty big concern for me so I want no pitching same thing with Kyle Freeland he's coming off the DL here he had in his non-throwing shoulder his right side um, he had a shoulder subluxation he landed on it goofy uh, but he's okay and he should be fine to battle again here tonight now same thing with Oakland like, they're gonna be really popular I don't think they should be as popular um, you know as they will be because they're you know, a bad team and a bad offense, but this is a Coors Field, and they hit lefties a hell of a lot better, create against lefties a hell of a lot better than they do against righties. So Oakland is absolutely in play too, um, and they're cheap enough to make pretty much anything you want happen. Every one of these guys is, you know, Zach Geloff has seen his price. He's the most expensive here at 4600 Everybody else is cheaper than that. Brent Rooker, I think, is a really, really good play here, 3800 Jordan Diaz is fine. Ramon Laureano just got activated recently. He's 3,200. So they all got price bumps relative to where they've been. So I don't generally want to be chasing that, but they're still underpriced for the upside that they'd offer in this particular matchup. Kyle Freeland's not going to throw past him. 85% contact rate with fly balls and hard contact against the right side of the plate. 211 ISO here. A lot of batting average, too. So uh, no pitching whatsoever. Offense only. It's just you got to balance constructions. I think everybody is a, is a good play in this game. Okay, I skipped a game, unfortunately. Uh, Texas and San Diego. Um, Dane Dunning on the mound. I just can't do it, man. There's just no swing and miss here. Now, I love the ground balls, right? And I love the cutter. This is a really good pitch. But there's no swing and miss. And he's still just throwing a two-seamer um, against the left side of the plate. He gets so much uh, roll over and ground ball type of contact against the right side. Um, that's where all of the value on the two-seamer is coming from. And... You know, he's at least very equitably split here with the two-seamer cutter against righties and lefties, respectively. That's how you need to structure it. But 
it's just a 15% K rate. He's efficient early in the count. He's efficient late in the count. He doesn't get barreled, and he induces rollover contact. So that makes him serviceable real-life arm. Um, but he got blasted against the Dodgers. And I, not that the Padres are a similar offense to the Dodgers or anything, but they got a couple of guys that could lift a baseball similar to L.A., uh, notably a Juan Soto, Jake Cronenworth from the left side of the plate. That's how he really got taken apart from the right side of the plate. Um, you know, you've still got Hassan Kim at a 4,000 leading off. Tati, 61, that's fine. Manny, 51. Xander Bogart's 44. That's a really good price for him. So you can play some Padres here. I think they're an off-the-board kind of stack. I generally don't like stacking against Dane Dunning because I really respect the, you know, for the most part, five pitches here that he's going to work with, uh, even though it's just kind of a show-me curveball. Um, bad change, so that's where he's mostly attackable with a left-hander. But, again, it, he kind of neutralizes that a little bit with the cutter. So not my favorite playing the Padres, but uh, this is still a very high upside offense that um, pretty rarely gets played anymore because they haven't performed all that much. Um, you know, they have the upside. Do they have it, you know, in terms of consistency? No, right? Just the 99 WRC plus no batting average whatsoever. So you need them to, uh, really kind of go off. And that's why I'd play full stacks rather than like one-offs, um, outside of a Xander Bogarts where he is very well priced or a Jay Cronenworth or a Juan Soto where the batted ball matchups are very good. Um, so no Dunning, maybe a little bit of the Padres, 9,700 for Musgrove. Uh, I just can't do it, man, at this price tag. And certainly it's his ownership. I think it's way too high. I still really respect Texas. I don't care if they're missing Corey Seager. Um, they're still going to create a hell of a lot here, right? 120 WRC plus. They took apart Framber Valdez the other night. They put a 13 spot on on Houston in like four innings, five innings or something. Now, this is a very good offense over here. So I don't want to deal with this with Musgrove at an elevated price tag, even though he's been streaking to the upside. Performances have been great recently. I still don't want to do it um, at at higher ownership. I think, uh, you know, in his last outing struck out six and six against Detroit, but gave up three runs. So I, you know, the full on suppression is still there in, in some down matchups as it was against Detroit. And this is a way down matchup. I mean, Detroit was a good matchup. I mean to say, this is a way down matchup, right? Against Texas, one of the top three offenses in baseball. So, um, Expensive price tag, high ownership here. I'm going to kind of stay off of it and come in under. Uh, rather pivot it to like a Mitch Keller, you know, who's a, quarter, a fraction of the ownership here, and he's cheaper, you know, or something like that. Um, so not jacked about it. Uh, I do like the five and six pitches here. He's throwing a lot of junk, uh, giving up a lot of value on the slider and a little bit on the changeup, but good fastball mix here. Um, you know, but unfortunately for him, Texas is a really, really good fastball hitting team. So he's not going to get as much value out of these pitches in this particular matchup that he would otherwise. Um, so I want to go after some of these fly ball hitters over here because he does still induce some ground balls. That's Semyon, that's Addy Garcia, that's Josh Young, a little bit of Zeke Duran. Um, Brad Miller, certainly from the left side of the plate, fly ball hitter. Mitch Garver, likely to be in there tonight. Jonah Heim came out, I believe, yesterday or two days ago uh, on Wednesday with a sore wrist. So I have to keep an eye on that. Um, but Leoti is playable down at the bottom of the lineup, too. And Mitch Garver is a very high fly ball hitter. And look at that. Joe Musgrove only strikes out 21% of right-handers. So you could play some of these righties here, Josh Young, Eddie Garcia, Mitch Garver. Their, their problem is strikeouts, right? So I think you can get some leverage stacks of Texas here. Uh, not my favorite stacking against Musgrove in general, of course, but and they're still expensive. 59 for Marcus Semien. It's, you know, not, it's kind of a throw-up price in this matchup, but um, that's going to keep them totally off the board in ownership here. And certainly in value as well, but I think they are viable from a batted ball perspective. I don't want to go out of my way to get crazy with it because Musgrove is still good. And he still has six pitches here, so let's not get wild. But uh, yeah, I think it's very much playable. Uh, okay, trying to speed things up here, so let's move on to Seattle and Arizona. Logan Gilbert, I think, is in play at 9,000 here. Um, no real outsized vulnerability to either side of the plate. If we're going to attack Logan Gilbert, it's going to be with some left-handers here. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to play a lot of him necessarily because I really respect Arizona, man. Um, where I really like, I uh, think it, Arizona excels is against average and, and below average right-handers. They've taken apart a good right-hander here or there, though, uh, this season. So it's not like they're totally inept against a good righty. And, and Logan Gilbert's a good righty. So I'd kind of like to side with him maybe a little bit, but 
I'm not sure I want a hell of a lot of him, to be quite honest. Um, at sub-3% ownership, yeah, like, sign me up because he's got upside at the price tag. You know, 9000 may be a little aggressive for this particular matchup, but the ownership discount there kind of makes up for that. So I think that has to put him in play. Still induces some ground balls to the right side. Um, maybe a little vulnerable to, like, a Christian Walker or a Lourdes Gurriel, maybe a Evan Longoria if they're in there. Um, but for the most part, you know, the suppression here is pretty damn good for Logan Gilbert. Doesn't walk anybody, right? And stays off of the barrel for the most part at just 9%. I say just, even though 9% is 9%. Um, overall, the hard contact numbers and, and power numbers allowed are, are fine. 163 and 31.5% aggregate hard contact. It's okay. I don't want to go out of my way to be stacking Arizona or anything, but you can always play Jerry uh, Perdomo up at the top. Cattell Marte from both sides, and Corbin Carroll, you can play against literally everybody. Um, and from the left side, that's pretty much it, I think. I don't want to deal with Jake McCarthy or Alec Thomas down at the bottom, so it'd be just the top three guys, but, uh, you know, you're really paying a lot for that and targeting a pretty good arm. So I think Logan Gilbert kind of has to be in play there, uh, even though I really like Corbin Carroll pretty much always. Uh, Tommy Henry is going for the D-backs. No thanks. Not at 6700 I think he's overpriced. Uh, I think he's a really good spot for Seattle, to be quite honest. He's a heavy fly ball pitcher. I mean, heavy to not necessarily heavy, right? 085 is not super heavy, but uh, it's notable for sure. Um, he induces, like, he doesn't give up a lot of hard contact, I should say. And that keeps him in play a lot of the time. And he's really been figuring it out. Four pitches and the good secondaries here with break-even change, but good slider, good curveball. Um that's helping him sort of establish a little bit and and manage some of the disaster that his four-seamer gets him into. 57% uh, strike one, though, is a concern, and we need this to tick higher if we're going to ever get excited about playing Tommy Henry with such a low, raw, swing and miss rate. Giving up a little bit of pop, but I don't really care about, you know, uh, realized um, metrics here against uh, in such a short sample. Against the lefties, right, 195 ISO, it's just kind of whatever. Same thing with a 11% walk rate. It's just kind of whatever um, since the sample is so small. But a 14% strikeout rate is notable here. An 070 ground ball to fly ball is a little bit notable, as is the strike one rate. So uh, right-handers mostly from Seattle, and I want to play pretty much everybody, to be quite honest. JP is in play here because he's not going to strike out, and he's going to lead off at 3,400. Julio, I really want to play him. He's been heating up uh, a lot recently, and I think he's a one of the best outfield plays of the day at 52. Gino Suarez, 32 still. Tay Oscar at 33. Uh, I want to play all of these guys here. Uh, Tom Murphy. All, like, all these guys' problem is strikeouts, right? And they're very cheap, and Tommy Henry's not going to blow it past them. So I want to play every single one of them, including Cal Raleigh behind the plate if he is in there. Uh, Dylan Moore, Josie Caballero, like whoever you want. Uh, I think Seattle is, is one of the top stacks of the day as well, um, mixing in with, you know, Cleveland, Minnesota, whoever, the Dodgers, Colorado, Oakland, you know, do whatever you want. Uh, all of these teams are in play. Seattle, I think, is right up at the top. Um, so no pitching here, really, for the most part. But you'd play correlated stacks with some Logan Gilbert here in deep tournament stuff if you want to do that. Maybe even a 20-max play. Don't think it's totally horrible, uh, even though I hate going after Arizona. Okay, Cincinnati and the Dodgers, 5,800 for Brandon Williamson. No thanks. Um, just 19% strikeout rate for him with a lot of fly balls also. 080 ground ball to fly ball. That could put him in play because the Dodgers mostly hit fly balls. However, they are, you know, adjusting the lineup over here a little bit. They're going to have Kike back in there. Um, he does have second and shortstop eligibility. He's 2,800. He's historically hit lefties very, very well, even though this season his numbers in Boston would have been terrible. Uh, he's back where he's going to be comfortable in L.A., um, and I'm sure he's probably pretty excited to be back with the Dodgers. Med Rosario, they did just pick up from Cleveland uh, for Noah Syndergaard. So, bye-bye, Syndergaard. Um, 3,900, he's unlikely to be up at the two-hole again. That was the only reason he was ever playable. But he's now down in the eight-hole now, and that's just a total non-starter. So, we don't have to deal with the very low upside Miggy Rojas anymore. Um, and they're going to be very balanced, you know, from the right side of the plate here. So I don't want to be playing any Brandon Williamson against Dodgers. Um, you know, these guys are still going to be able to hit the baseball on a line. You know, Will Smith, Buki Betts, Chris Taylor, all fly ball hitters from the right side. Uh, Kike will, and Med Rosario will hit some ground balls. JD, fly ball hitter, 
I mean, this is a dangerous list to be going after. This is what makes the Dodgers one of the top stacks of the day. They'll be very popular, probably like with Oakland, with Cleveland, you know, where you can make the price tags happen. And correlated teams with Bobby Miller here at 7,700. Like, you're not going to fool anybody necessarily. Uh, but I've got no problem playing it because it's still a 14-game slate. You don't have to worry about ownership all that often. Um, but some of these guys will be very popular, notably like a Will Smith, J.D. Martinez, Buki Betts from the right side of the plate. Chris Taylor will be, see some ownership as well. They're very stackable because they've got a lot of uh, position flexibility here. Buki's got second and outfield again. They'll probably leave him up in the outfield. Um, because Kike is likely to be at second base. Med Rosario will be at shortstop. So they've solidified their infield here, and that means Mookie's going to move back to right field um, most often. So you can you can really move things around here. Chris Taylor's got dual eligibility third in the outfield as well. Uh, so I like the Dodgers here uh, a pretty good bit going after uh, Williamson. Um, just not a lot of strikeout stuff, and you need that against Dodgers. So no thanks. Uh, Bobby Miller at 77. I'm okay with this too, but I want to be careful with it because I really hate going after the Reds, man. This offense has been fantastic over the last two months and you know, really one of the best four or five teams of baseball. So do I want to play Ellie at 6,100? Eh, probably not, but um, you know he's dual eligible and he's Ellie De La Cruz and he's got a hell of a lot of upside. Um, you know He's stolen home twice this season, right? How many other guys in baseball can claim that? Um that said, he's 6,100. I don't really want to go out of my way to be doing that against a guy that throws 100 down in the strike zone. Um, he'll strike out a lot, too, and that's really kind of Ellie's weakness, so not great. Matt McClain going to strike out. 5,900 still for him. Jake Fraley, 49. Joey Votto, 46. Right, So these guys are not cheap, uh, which means we'd probably just have to like take some shorts on them at their price tags and just be like, well, they're not going to perform um, you know, to that upside. So, yeah, give me a little bit of Bobby Miller. That's okay, playing correlated teams. However, Reds are absolutely in play because Bobby Miller's going to see a lot more ownership on the late slate. Reds are only in play, at least for me, on the late slate. I think they're just too expensive. I'd rather get to some other teams. But I think they're a really intriguing tournament stack, um, getting a little bit of leverage, or maybe like a short stack with some very high upside pieces down late, like a Joey Votto, um, Ellie De La Cruz, Jake Fraley, TJ Friedel type, something along those types of lines. Uh, Will Benson's been fantastic over the last month plus. He's got like a an OPS over a thousand this month, and he's still just 3,300 in the nine hole. But uh, you know, good 3,300 piece there. So uh, I think some offense here is, is definitely in play. Bobby Miller, yeah, for sure for the Dodgers, uh, and mostly just the Dodgers. No Williamson. Okay, last game here, Boston and San Francisco. Uh, Cutter Crawford, 6,500. I think he's got to be in play here. And this is one of the guys I was referring to at the outset when I said I think a couple you know, cheap pieces might be attackable down here. And it's Cutter Crawford. I really generally don't like playing him because um, he gives up pop to the left side. But he only gives up a 210 batting average. He's really gotten it under control with the Cutter later on in the season uh, compared to his early appearances, like out of the bullpen, for example. Um this game is in San Francisco, and it's 60 degrees tonight. So I've really got no issue going after San Francisco. They're going to platoon very heavily, probably only have two righties, maybe three, in the lineup here tonight with J.D. Davis, who hits a crap load of ground balls. Uh, not really worried about that necessarily at 4,300. Um, and then they'll have, like, Luis Matos, Marco Luciano uh, that they just called up. Um, you know, Luciano's just a kind of a low upside you know, middle infield type of piece, um, you know, similar to a Casey Schmidt, for example. Um, to, but they're going to have a lot of lefties in here, and Crawford's got a 27.5% K rate against the left side. It will give up fly balls, yeah, but they hit a lot of fly balls. So the favorite would have to be, uh, you know, probably like a Michael Conforto, I would say. Uh, Lamont Wade doesn't strike out a lot, uh, nor does Jock necessarily against right-handed pitching. So a short stack of Wade, Jock Peterson, Michael Conforto would be good. Probably would like to stay off of Yaz a little bit. He hits too many fly balls um, and makes a lot of soft contact himself. And that's kind of why I'd like to maybe play a little bit of Cutter Crawford. He's very low ownership here and high strikeout rate. These guys are still going to swing and miss a little bit uh, against right-handed pitching and a lot of soft contact for them. So I think that has to put Cutter Crawford in play in 60 degrees in San Francisco. Uh, so let's do it. Logan Webb, he's been struggling a little bit recently. He's had one good outing, but that was Colorado at home. You know, when he you know, threw a complete game, struck out like 10, I think. 
Um, 10-2, I think this is okay. He's got to be in play, certainly, because he induces so many ground balls. Two and a half ground balls per fly ball, and he still has whiffs. However, he's going to kind of struggle a little bit to throw it past people in this particular mat matchup outside of Jaron Duran, Adam Duvall, and Tristan Casas. Um, you know, every, nobody else strikes out. Turner, Yoshida, Devers, you know, Alex Verdugo doesn't strike out, etc. So, kind of a hard strikeout matchup, even though they're going to... He'll induce some ground balls. Uh, Jaron Duran be able to lift it maybe a little bit. Certainly Devers can lift it. Yoshida not going to be able to lift it. So I don't really want to be playing him at 4,800 or anything like that. But Justin Turner can lift it a little bit. And he's not going to strike out a lot. Um, Verdugo's still a ground ball hitter for the most part. Tristan Cassis can lift it. So it's kind of a, uh, a, I don't know, a fishy matchup a little bit here for Logan Webb. Not super jacked about a price tag at 10-2. Um, so I kind of like to stay off of that a little bit, I think, but he has to be in play because it's 60 degrees in, in San Francisco and he induces two and a half ground balls per fly ball and he's got whiffs, you know, so he's got to be in play pretty much every time, uh, against most lineups in baseball. Uh, and that includes Boston who is pretty good, right? Only a 21% strikeout rate, 106 WRC plus, and they hit for some average, 270. That's really where Logan Webb kind of gets into trouble a little bit. It's mostly against the right side. So that'd be like an Adam Duvall, Justin Turner type, uh, maybe a Connor Wong or something. But like, you are we really stacking teams uh, when it's 100 degrees elsewhere and it's 60 degrees in San Francisco? I mean, against Logan Webb, like let's uh, let's slow down. So um, not my favorite getting to really much of any offense. I'd prefer mostly pitching here. Uh, okay, I think that is it. We are done. Let's go over a quick review. Yankees, Baltimore. Sure, some Garrett Cole, but I'm probably just going to stay off and, and pivot it elsewhere. It's like a Gosman uh, or just get cheaper. Grayson, yeah, he's in play 6,300. Um, bad numbers, though, you know, undeniably. And they get judged back tonight. So um, you want to stack the Yankees? Well, you're probably not going to be the only one because people have been itching to play Aaron Judge. Uh, so yeah, no offense really for me, mostly respect the pitching. And if I got to choose, it's just Grayson, but, um, you know, an offensive piece here or there, you can always play judge. Of course, uh, Philly and Pittsburgh, uh, kind of a write off game for me here as well. Maybe some short stacks against both of these guys, but I don't like their price tags necessarily. If I had to choose it'd be Mitch Keller. Um, but I, I do like Kyle Schwarber 4,600. I think that's a pretty good play here tonight. And maybe like a Jimin Choi or something really off the board, sort of one-off um, against Zach Wheeler. Short stacks, of, you know, of course, with like a, uh, a Jack Swinski, Andy Rodriguez, those are in play too against Wheeler. But I'm not going out of my way to stack against either of these guys in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, Angel Serrano can't play Giolito, and not like we necessarily would anyway. Gosman, yeah, for sure. Um, probably come in under 30% personally, but... Uh, just because he's 10-8, and he gives up a high barrel rate and some hard contact in the air to left-handers. So that's Shohei territory. I'm not playing any of the other lefties, you know, no Mickey Moniak um, at 4,900. But uh, Shohei for sure, if we can make it happen. Toronto, yeah, maybe a little bit, uh, but kind of lukewarm on him. Favorite here is probably just got to be Matt Chapman, 4,600. I think that's an okay play. Uh, Washington and the Mets. Mackenzie Gore I, I like in the mid-range as a pivot off of Bobby Miller. 7,300. I think there's upside for him at that price tag going after the Mets. I don't really want to play the Mets because I don't think they're very good, um, even though they've been okay a little bit recently. Uh, just not all that impressive. They got taken apart by JoJo yesterday. Um, so, yeah, do you, you want to play a couple of their – yeah, like Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso, Tommy Pham types. I mean, sure, going after Mackenzie Gore. He's got some bad numbers. Let's not get it confused. But he's got a lot of whips, too. Uh, Max Scherzer, 94. I'm probably going to come uh, come in under and stay off of this a little bit. I think some Washington pieces are in play. Probably short stacks because I hate the ballpark. I hate the offense. Uh, but Scherzer gives up way too many fly balls, a lot of power. Um, and he gives up a lot of homers here. So I think that plays up Washington a little bit here tonight. Cleveland, definitely. Uh Against uh, Tuki Toussaint, uh, he's just got a ridiculously high walk rate. He doesn't strike anybody out, um, you know, from the left side at least. And Cleveland's going to have 26 righties in the lineup tonight. So no pitching here for me because Curry's only going to go probably two, three innings. You can play both the White Sox and Cleveland here. Um, you know, price adjusted, they're really, really good plays. You can stack this game if you want. And it's a big ballpark, but it's very warm in Chicago tonight. So, yeah, let's do it. I think that's okay. Uh, Milwaukee and Atlanta, I would probably prefer some short stacks of both teams here uh, just because their price tags are not all that attractive. 
It's not that the matchups are bad uh, because you're not playing Adrian Hauser or Yanni Chirinos. Um, you can always play Atlanta. Always definitely go ahead and play Atlanta. Um, Milwaukee, favorite's got to be like a, a Freelick or a Kristen Yelich, I guess, from contact perspectives. Um, maybe a Bryce Terang from the right side. I mean, I don't even know. Like, I guess Willie Adamas, but like, yikes. Um, and of course, you know, everybody from the Braves, if you can make decent constructions happen. Uh, Tampa and Houston, I'm going to stay off of McClanahan tonight. Really, really bad matchup against Houston, but I'm going to stack all of Tampa. I really like this spot for them against Christian Javier, even though it's mostly left-handers. Um, that they're going to see, or that he's going to see. And it's a little more difficult to get there with lefties in Houston than right-handers. But I think some of the righties are in play, too, like at Isaac Paredes or Harold Ramirez, certainly Randy Arozarena with the short porch at the Crawford boxes. Um, you want to play Jordan Alvarez? Yeah, go ahead and play him every night. But I'm not playing Altuve at 5,700 against McClanahan. That's not happening. Same thing with Jeremy Pena, 43. Even though they're not striking out a lot, uh, I still don't like the aggregate price tags here. Um the only guy I'd really consider would be Chaz McCormick, but he's 4,100 in the seven hole against McClanahan. So, I mean, just give me Jordan. That's pretty much it for me. Minnesota, yeah, everybody here. Uh, mostly the left-handers, but you can mix in some righties like a Byron Buxton uh, or either one of the catchers, Michael Taylor down at the bottom. That's fine in stacks. No Brady Singer. I just can't do it. The numbers are just dreadful. Um, Sonny Gray, yeah, sure. You want to play some correlated teams? I think that's good. That'll keep you off the board a little bit. And contrarian. Um, in your Minnesota stacks. I don't want anything to do with Kansas City here tonight. Um, if it would be anybody, I mean, hey, geez. Like, Kyle Isbell, 2,500, I guess. Like, yikes. Uh, but it would be a lefty because of, you know, Sunday Gray's 18% strikeout rate or whatever against the left side. Cubs, St. Louis. Um, very little of the Cubs here tonight for me personally. Um, just because I, I, I don't like going after Jordan Montgomery generally. Uh, certainly on a 14 game slate, I think it, you know, there's other op offenses with higher upside. Um, Jordan Montgomery, sure, but I got upside questions too. St. Louis, yeah, I want to go after a little bit of Drew Smiley. Um, they're all pretty well priced here outside of Goldschmidt and Arenado. Oakland, Colorado, offense only, obviously, and you got to balance just ownership and constructions, but I think Colorado is one of the better stacks of the day for sure, as is Oakland, of course, because they're way cheap. Texas, San Diego, probably not going to go out of my way to stack Texas, but I'm not going to go out of my way to play Musgrove either. So um, really just kind of a write-off here for me. A little bit of San Diego going after some Dane Dunning, but I really respect him too. Um, good ground ball rate, good cutter here, soft contact pitch for him against lefties. So kind of meh for the most part. Um, interesting tournament, tournament, tournament game, I should say, getting some leverage off of Musgrove. He's overpriced, and I think he's too popular to, uh, for the matchup, frankly. Uh, Seattle and Arizona, offense mostly here. A little bit of Arizona going after Gilbert, but not much. Um, some correlated Gil Gilbert teams, definitely. And for Seattle, I, you know, I want to stack everybody Go getting after Tommy Henry here. Uh, even though I hate the offense, uh, they're generally bad. I think it's a really good spot for them. Cincy and the Dodgers, very little Cincy. Late slate play for sure. Um, targeting Bobby Miller, who will be very popular. And mostly just the Dodgers here um, on the main slate, including Bobby Miller. I like him at 7,700. I think it's okay. I don't want to go crazy with it. Cause this is, I still really respect this offense over here. Um, you know, just don't necessarily want to play them in DFS because they're expensive. Boston and San Francisco last game here, mostly just pitching and, uh, you know, a couple, you know, San Francisco pieces. Um, Conforto, I think, is probably the best play here. Uh, maybe a Lamont Wade, Jock Peterson, something like that, but mostly just pitching. Uh, okay, we are done here. Uh, so keep an eye out for the projections and ownership pushes as always, and good luck to everybody here on the large Friday 14 Gamer.